and on in New York. And we're being recorded. Lewis Holland, good to see you, Lewis. Just, Holland, down, the road from, just down the road from where I am. Schwan, I see you come in. You're in Istanbul, I know. Tanya, you're in, in Vienna. And Bob, you're in Surrey. <laughs> Not so far away. <laughs> Do, um, do come on with your, uh, with your screens if, uh, if you so choose. I know there's quite a few other people um, who said they're joining us, so we'll let them in as we go. Um, but we want to obviously keep on time. Uh, I think there's somebody else coming in here. So we were just saying um, the last, I'm very, very rusty at this, the last forum TV we did was in the beginning of December of last year, you know. So this is back to the good old days of lockdown when we uh, we weren't allowed out of our front doors. But now, of course, then we suddenly all got fatigued with Zoom. But I did always think, and funny enough, I talked quite a lot to both Chris and to Elizabeth, who are our panelists tonight, that um, we would, should keep the forum TV idea alive and maybe bring it back at a, a sort of an apposite moment, if you like. And then with the... Um, the recent sad death of, of our queen, Elizabeth II, and indeed the succession of Charles III, um, it seemed like an absent moment to, to question the institution of monarchy and uh, indeed to think through the, kind of the future of democracy. So thank you so much for, uh, for joining this call and, and coming back to, uh, to Forum TV. And, and there's Effie from New York. Effie, we've got to stop meeting like this. Third time, third time in a week on three continents. Um, I know. I, I see you more than, than the family. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. So firstly, uh, just for the moment, many apologies from Alan Hilberg. I mean, he's currently in Palo Alto and he's caught on a call with a significant client. Um, but he is going to try and uh, join the conversation uh, later. Okay. <laughs> oh, I got it. <laughs> We used to be so good at this, all of us. Do you remember those days when we were very slick on Zoom? Have we, have we canceled that person? I think we have canceled that person. So, so the title of our talk uh, this afternoon, this evening, um, is Democracy Needs Monarchy. And Elizabeth, Chris and I would like to lead the conversation uh, through the future of democracy towards what political system do we, the populace, want? And what system do we trust to deliver us stability? Um, and the future of democracy, you know, was, um, albeit created in Greek and Roman times, it is actually inherently only 150 years old, really, in terms of Western democracy. And so therefore it's fragile. And I think that it's with the, the question of uh, the Queen's death and, and the accession of King Charles III just brought to mind for me you know, just how fragile is democracy and do we perhaps in the UK really depend on uh, the, the monarchy, we seem to at the time of the last fortnight or so, to, to bring us all together as people. So, so Elizabeth Burke, um, first of all, can I um, introduce Elizabeth, Linda and Chris before we get on to the questions? Um, Elizabeth um, and Chris, both members of Forum. Elizabeth, uh, founder of global advisory firm Broach Associates. Um, and her clients are, are government leaders, corporate executives, and directors of think tanks and academic institutions. And her focus is on navigating complex geopolitical and issue-based challenges and opportunities. And I very much wanted to have Elizabeth on the call, not least because she's a great friend of Forum, but also because she can deliver us the American voice, if you like, and delivering us the, the, the British voice, the UK voice, is Chris, Chris Wilkins, also a good friend and supporter and member of Forum. And um, Chris is the managing partner at Audley, which is also uh, an advisory firm working with leaders in government and business. And Chris has a long track record in Westminster and Whitehall with a deep understanding of the workings of government and he's also been a director of strategy and chief speechwriter at number 10. So um, the question to head off with is Elizabeth perhaps you start us. Um, if we consider the status of democracy today say both in the UK and the US um, how well is it working do you think? Perhaps you could give us a couple of thoughts on that. 
Thank you so much, Simon. Wonderful to see you all again here on Zoom. It feels, as you said, very old school, which is which is quite good. Um, and uh, you'll see uh, behind me, I have a nod to um, both of the uh, topics that we'll discuss. I have Alexi de Tocqueville's Democracy in America uh, near the US Constitution there, as well as a picture that might be a little bit hard to see, but from the extraordinary opportunity I had to meet the Queen. So um, I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Just to kickstart a couple of, of ideas, you know, the first thing that I think about when you pose the question about whether our democracies, um, you know, in the West, especially uh, transatlantically US UK are working is I cast my mind back to that horrible horrifying feeling of uh, being an American in London watching um, September 6th go down um, on on TV and for any of us uh, Americans who were on this time zone uh, we might remember it was quite late at night our time um, you know, totally an unexpected experience to see our own nation's capital uh, overrun with was um, it was just absolutely horrifying. But at the same time, whilst so much of our commentary about that day is so negative and rightfully so, what we also saw was an incredible coming together of democratically built institutions that were working to ensure that at the end of the day that election got done and it got certified and you know each individual who had voted had their votes um, counted and so many elements went into that process but watching those local leaders you know day in and day out make sure that that process gets done uh watching everybody come back um to you know, to the Capitol to ensure that that election day was was finished off as it should be. The challenging um, and the testing of democracy that day was very real, but equally real was the resiliency and, and the strength. So I know we're going to have time a little bit to talk about, um, you know, more specifically the cast of characters that are involved right now in ensuring that pursuit. But all in all, I think it's quite easy to be a pessimist right now in terms of the future of democracy, but I also think we have to recognize that we have uh, we have built um, in our societies incredible checks and balances on a very complicated system um, that that are working and that are uh, you know working tested but working when when they need to to work. Yes, and Chris, what, what would you like to say apropos what Liz, Liz has said? Yeah, uh, look, and, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, to join this this fascinating conversation, meaty conversation for Monday. Um, uh, I think I, I'd like to really firstly probably support a lot of what Elizabeth has said. Though. I think it is, uh, as you say, Elizabeth, easy to be sort of slightly negative and pessimistic about uh these issues in the future of democracy and, and there are causes for that that I might come to in a second but overall um I think you know the the systems in the UK have been tested in recent years um and on balance uh they have come through that test um but it does require as you say Elizabeth it requires people to stand up it requires leaders to stand up and politicians to stand up and um ultimately it does rest on that. And, you know, it could be that they choose not to and they go the other way. So it is fragile, definitely. But on balance, I think our system has come through uh, the test of recent years. And we might touch on some of those things in, in particular um, as, as, we, as the discussion goes on. Um, but the, you know, there is a dangerous conversation becomes entirely uh, me saying, well, it depends what you mean by that. So I'll try not to do it, but you know, actually what is democracy is, is, is kind of a, a topic for a whole talk all, all of its own. Um, the one thing I would say is that uh, actually my view, if I bring it to the UK, um, has evolved on this a little in recent years. We had a, um, a referendum a few years ago, not that referendum, not the Brexit one, we all know about that, but before that, um, we had a referendum under the coalition government about the voting system uh, in the United Kingdom and being a, a good Tory, I, I was on the side of no change, let's stick with what we've got. Do you know, I think I was wrong about that. Uh, and I'm not the only person on the Conservative side of the fence who thinks that. Um, and I think um, if we bring it down to first past the post and the system we have in the UK, I do think that um, is facing some challenges. 
Um, and uh, just give you a couple of reasons why. Um, basically, in the UK system, uh, we have, broad, broadly speaking, 650 seats in, in Parliament. Um, it's anticipated or estimated that about half of those are safe seats um, for one party or another. So the people in those seats effectively don't really have a say on the future and uh, uh, the outcome of elections. Um, and something that's very personal to me, the 2017 uh, election, still haven't got over it many years ago, but there we are. I will do one day. Um, but the Prime Minister lost her majority and had to run a minority government afterwards. But it's estimated in that election, if she'd won just 400 more seats, uh, 400 more votes across eight seats, then she would have had a majority in the House of Commons. And it seems to me that that system, the system we have in the UK, um, is being sorely tested for a number of reasons and maybe isn't uh, ultimately sustainable and needs to change to, so that people are properly represented. Um, but as an institutional basis, as you say, Elizabeth, I think our institutions that underpin our democracy are still strong. Yes. And of course, you know, we, we don't want, we, we must talk about the UK and we must talk about the US. And, and also, of course, I'm conscious that there are, are, are Europeans in the room as well here. But, but also just to, just to bring in at this stage, I was going to bring it in later, but just the whole um, stage of totalitarian states as well, if we're talking about government as a whole, because I was, remember being very struck just, just before um, Putin invaded Ukraine. You remember there was a, a meeting between Putin and Xi Jinping, and, they, and, and one of the big statements they made was that both their respective governments represented true and genuine democracy. So, you know, so, so our view of democracy is a view of democracy. I just thought mm. I might just ask both mm. of you geopolitical experts, why would um, those two leaders, if you like, consider what we believe to be a totalitarian state? Why would they consider to be that a genuine democracy? Mm. Uh, Chris first, perhaps. Um, well, it brings to mind, uh, I worked in um, Iraq uh, after the invasion there, and I was working there in 2006, and I just always remember we were conducting focus groups uh, amongst the Iraqi people uh, at the time, and it just always sticks in my mind that uh, one of the comments that came back from those focus groups was that um, somebody saying, all we want is a real democracy like Dubai. Um, and of course, what they meant was economic prosperity um, and the economic freedom that went with it. It wasn't about voting, it wasn't about representation, it was about that. And I sort of think there's a bit of that about what uh, President Putin and President Xi are saying. They're saying, uh, actually, it's about outcomes. It's about kind of the kind of life that you have. It's not about the inputs. It's not about your representation, um, which is obviously uh, uh, you know, scary from our point of view. But there is a challenge to our democracy in that, um, in that... You know, it's it's often noted in in political circles that you know for people like Putin and for people like Xi, you know they don't have to worry about elections, so they can think long term, they can strategize, they can have 10, 20, 30 year plans and see them through, um, and that is a challenge for elected politicians because we think in four or five year cycles, sometimes less than that. I think in the US, um, you know, <laughs> in the UK it's four to five years. Um, and then you have for election again. So you can't plan strategically over the long term. So there's a real challenge for democracies versus autocracies when it comes to actually delivering uh, on your promises. And that is difficult. Yeah, Elizabeth. And, yeah, what I would add to that, I'm, first of all, I certainly wouldn't turn to Putin or Xi to uh, ace a US history exam on democracy and, and what it means <laughs> and what it entails. Um, what I would add to that, and I agree with, with what Chris has just said, but one of the strongest points around the societies that we live in is the ability to skirt around and bend the rules now and then. And I think that's really important because that's what empowers people. Now, of course, you know, uh, when it comes to law enforcement or, uh, you know, all of these sorts of things, you need to have policies in place, you need to have trust in your judicial system. But you do need to have a, a society that does believe that a set of rules is not set in stone for the next 30 years in order to attract creative minds, um, entrepreneurial minds that feel that they also can have a vested interest in the shared prosperity that everyone is building. So my 
perspective on this would be for a small club of individuals in any given country, there's always going to be the opportunity for economic prosperity, because if you know the right people and you have the right job and you have the right connections, you can make that happen. But what's so critical to the societies that we've built in the US and in the UK is that opportunity to um, to do the hack job, you know, to make it up as you go, to think that perhaps there's an opportunity for something to change if you just try hard enough. Sometimes that's not helpful and all of us would just wish that, uh, wish would, people would just kind of uh, stand in the queue and be quiet, but at other times that's exactly what we need to question the systems that we've built um, and, you know, even to, to, test their, to test their resilience. Yeah, well, I think if we may, we'll come back to that. But I'd like to get on to the subject of monarchy now. Yes. And obviously, you know, we were extremely sad at the death of the Queen. I think everybody around the world was. Um, and she was an extraordinary character in that what we realised uh, in our morning was the unity that she had brought to, 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 to all of us, particularly here in the UK. Um, and I think, you know, that came about, as we realised, because... For 70 years, she had absolutely stuck to her one avowed pledge, which was to be the servant to her people. And so that incredible respect, we all really understood it as she died, as to what we, what we were missing. And so I think she, she did monarchy a good turn, let's put it that way. So, but does, you know, but, you know, that monarchy has no right to exist in today's world. You know, the fact that you're born into that privilege, you know, it just it's not of this world uh, antithetically. However, you know, the more one thinks about it, you more within the UK, certainly. And this is where it'd be very interesting, Elizabeth, to contrast. I know you're, you're living in the UK, but very interesting to contrast this with the US. You know, the more one thinks about it, the more you realise that actually monarchy has really helped democracy in this country you know we it's kept the nation and politics separate and so i would love to hear take your view perhaps you first elizabeth as a, yeah. as a as a us but a, an anglophile and a resident here in london you know what how, when you come to this country with your with your californian hat on what is it what is it about monarchy or, that um that is either attractive or not attractive to this to the institution of democracy Yes, well, some of you who are joining today's uh, discussion from the States may have noticed that the BBC turned on access uh, to all of its programming for Americans uh, in the US region uh, momentarily throughout uh, the, the funeral um, and also uh, live broadcast then on, on PBS, not just BBC News, but the, the, the full of the, of the funeral. Um, and most of my you know, family chose to uh, go to bed during the day on Sunday so that they could get up at midnight and then watch everything live um, and not miss, miss a moment. So to back up, I think it's really important to understand, first of all, that the American Revolution was not rooted in overthrowing a king. It was not rooted in overthrowing a monarchy. Yeah. Um, in fact, it was a very slow burn. But what's really insightful about the US revolution is that it was not led by radicals. It was led by uh, socially and politically conservative individuals who were loyal um, you know, to the crown and to, this, and to this country. And over time, what started to happen is polite requests uh, to gain that seat at the table um, and to actually have the colonies, which were starting to have a serious economic impact on the whole uh, of, of the empire, um, you had this, this request then to have more and more than a vo voice at a table that was proportionate to what the colonies were contributing to the empire. So I just wanted to start there. And in fact, I love the, the, um, the works by Gordon Wood. I know this is a very well-read group of people, but his particular book called Just Simply the American Revolution is a quite short read, but it brilliantly captures this idea of how it is that a group of quite conservative individuals evolved into uh, being, a, being uh, you know, um, treasonous uh, in their signing of the Declaration of Independence, which we all know any num none of them would have been hanged had the Americans not won that revolution. 
So our revolution was rooted in no taxation without representation. It was not rooted in overthrowing a monarch. It evolved very gradually into needing to uh, go out on our, on our own. Um, I'm a graduate of uh, Princeton University, which of course was founded by, uh, by the Scots during the um, Great uh, Awakening. And um, it's quite interesting that, you know, the, uh, the charter, the university is one of nine universities that predate uh, the, his, the, the US revolutionary period. Um, so it was founded in 1746. And in its hall, um, you have a giant portrait of uh, the king um, who, you know, granted the royal charter for the university at the time. Now, during the American Revolution, Princeton was a hotbed of revolutionary sentiment. And so the portrait was very politely taken out of the hall and removed. After the revolution, the king was put back um, because the king was part of that history of the school. And that's such a nice allegory for why it is that Americans sometimes seem so, uh, you know, so loving of the British uh, royal family and of the queen. Um, that actually goes way back to, to our history. We don't see ourselves as anti-monarchists. We see ourselves as wanting a seat at the table before you tax us. <laughs> That's very good. So Chris, what is your response? Or what is your, what is your answer to that, to, to, my, to my question about your sort of opening thoughts on monarchy, keeping nation and politics separate? How, how hmm. do you feel? Particularly, you know, you had many years behind behind the door at number 10. So perhaps you'd give us an insight there as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, objectively, um, if you were designing a system now, if objectively monarchy is, obviously it doesn't make sense from that point of view, you know, it makes no, makes very little sense that somebody who happens to be born into a family, uh, you know, we, we bow and curtsy to them and, and things like that. Um, um, but I think from certainly our perspective in terms of the UK, it, it, it just works. Um, and if it works, um, you know, we're not about to sort of throw it, uh, throw it out. And, you know, certainly recent polling shows that um, certainly since the Jubilee celebrations earlier in the year, um, which I was involved with, um, actually support for the monarchy has gone up. It's gone up again um, since uh, Her Majesty's passing. Um, and you know, there's very limited appetite. I think there's about twenty percent sort of support for a referendum on it. But you know, most people think it's here and it's here to stay. Um, so it works, um, and it works because exactly as you say, Simon, um, it does uh, keep that separation um, between politics and head of state. But you could argue that our politicians would be doing a very good job of advertising the importance of having monarchy there in recent times, um, because otherwise you have. Boris Johnson or Liz Truss was head of state. So interesting thought. Um, but uh, it works from that point of view. I remember from the inside uh, how um, the Prime Minister would go off for their weekly audience with Her Majesty. Um, and it was just such a uh, almost a, a relief for them to have that sort of half an hour to an hour of private time. And actually, my old boss Teresa said recently how um, it was the one meeting she went to where she knew nothing would leak. So she really could just talk to somebody who had been there and experienced you know, an awful lot of stuff um, and was able to give good advice. So it's it's a sort of steadying force uh, in that regard. Mm. But it is that unifying force. Um, and that matters here. When the Jubilee took place earlier in the year, I was um, the strategy director for the event that took place on the Sunday, the, the, the pageant, the sort of slightly mad event where we had all sorts of people parading down the mall and things like that. And when we sort of started out on that journey, we said that the, the main thing that this event needs to do is actually it's not really about the Queen, it's really about the country. And it needs to recognise that there are movements within our society here, both within societies about divisions, but also across nations. There were divisions in you know, Scotland, um, increasingly trying to be independent, uh, Northern Ireland, difficulties, Wales as well, etc. And this should be a big unifying moment. But even as we put that together, you didn't know if people would turn out. We had visions of there being sort of people thronging the parks in London and tuning in online and on TV, etc. But you never quite know. But they all came and it happened. And it was a wonderful, just unifying moment. And for that time, we sort of slightly forgot um, the divisions between us. Um, and it wasn't just, you know, older people. It was right across the generations uh, as well. 
Um, so it's, I think it's one of these things that don't look at it too carefully because it sort of is objectively speaking slightly absurd, but it just works and it works for all those reasons. Uh, and I think that's why, um, you know, we value it so, so much in, in the UK. And so what do you think, I mean, it, it, the strength of the monarchy to date, as we all know it, has been reliant on the individual character of the mm. Queen. So, first of all, I, I'm hoping that you would agree with that. Uh, if you don't, that's fine. But, but, but what are your thoughts on Charles III? And, you know, how reliant is monarchy? I mean, we've had bad monarchs. You know, we had, we had King Edward VIII last week. So how, so not, not that Prince Charles is likely to do that, but, but um, you, know, what, you know, what are we going to expect from, perhaps Chris, what are we going to expect from, from Charles III? And will monarchy remain safe and strong in, and unquestionable in terms of its value to British democracy in his hands? Um, I think the early signs of that are very good. Um, and that wasn't necessarily guaranteed. Um, but I think from the moment really he ascended uh, the throne, uh, I struggle to think that he's, he's put a foot wrong. Um, in the speech he made um, from Buckingham Palace, he was really, really clear in that speech that his sort of days of activism um, are now behind him and he has to take that more neutral role. And one of the reasons uh, the Queen was such a su successful monarch was because until her passing nobody really knew what she thought about anything uh, and that's that was really valuable now obviously Charles we has a bit of history but he has to leave that behind and he's, he's being clear he's going to sort of leave the activism behind and um, be that sort of more neutral monarch that's good he also did something which wasn't uh, again guaranteed when I was briefed when I worked in Downing Street on there were two plans one was Operation London Bridge which was the plan for the Queen's funeral and then there's um, Operation Spring Tide, which was the plan for the uh, new king to take over. When I was briefed in 2016, what was really noticeable then was that that plan, Operation Spring Tide, didn't include any plans for the king to do anything like visit the four nations of the United Kingdom. Um, it was a very um, almost, I hesitate to use the word inhuman, but it wasn't a very sort of empathetic um, sort of plan at that time um, and lots of us pointed out that that wouldn't go down very well so I was really pleased to see in his first few days as king he um, went to Scotland, England, Northern Ireland and Wales very quickly and he was very very well received he turned up at Buckingham Palace and he got out the car and um, went to speak yeah. to people shook hands things like this things like this matter in a monarch and it wasn't guaranteed with this monarch but I think he's had a really positive start. And I think the polling, again, suggests people have responded to that. Uh, and currently, um, people are very favourable towards him. And just as a matter of side interest, do you think that came from him? Uh, I think he's been well advised. Um, I think uh, he's been well advised by the people around him. Um, but actually, uh, I'm told uh, that one of his key advisors is the Queen Consort, Camilla, who is a very human person. Right. Uh, and who I think has been uh, really brilliant and, uh, by his side throughout this period. Yeah. I mean, I, if I could just add to that, I think as well, um, because as Prince of Wales, Charles championed so many issues that people and especially young people care about so much today. It's been interesting this week to see the reaction to King Charles pulling out of, uh, out of COP in Egypt mm -hmm. And almost everyone's saying, whoa, don't leave yeah. us now. You know, you still have to, you still have a planet to help us fix. Um, but what a, what a fascinating reaction because there's a sense that he, in so many ways, throughout this very long training for the key role was ahead of a lot of issues that people, you know, care so much about, whether that's organic farming or everything that he's doing on the sustainability front. I think something else that we don't talk about enough, but probably should, is that through democratizing, um, a democratizing force in our governments and even in our daily lives, which is a very good thing, we've also gotten a lot more casual. Um, we've stripped out a lot of the beauty and spaces where we spend our time. So it's great that we can fly around the world at such a cheaper rate. But then the trade-off is that, you know, airports and airplanes are not particularly splendid. You know, they, they serve their, their purpose. They serve a function. 
So I think in part, our societies occasionally need um, something that's really just beautiful to watch. And, you know, the pageantry and the perfectly pressed uniforms and uh, the, dare I say, the brooches, every element of what a monarchy does to uphold an element both of the stability that Chris referenced, and I, and I endorse that point wholeheartedly and agree with that, but in addition to the stability, they're still one of the few bastions of places in our society where you can unabashedly um, dress up and be respectful and have formalities that I don't think our citizens even realize sometimes we miss or would like to see a bit more of. And we love the fact that we can wander around in today's world, you know, in our yoga pants. But equally, when we turn on the, you know, the, the BBC, it is quite, it was quite splendid to see, you know, the crown and the orb and the scepter and, and, and watch that transition from the coffin to, to the church and, and to the state. Um, and that's such a soft issue, but I think it matters um, because I think it's one of the reasons why we're mesmerized um, by just how beautiful it all is. I, I would agree. I think it was very, very important and, and it touched all of us and it was sort of beyond most of our daily lives. So we we re and it honed over centuries. So we really had to stand back and just really, really allow that to come by, you know. So, yeah, amazing. So we will take questions. I know we've got a question from Effie and we've got another 10, 12 minutes or so to go until we we close on this. Um, Effie, there you are in New York. Can you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Thank you. Uh, Chris started uh, touching the subject of external relations by addressing the, uh, the recent visits. So I wanted to expand on it a little bit. Um, a couple of nations took the opportunity uh, around the, uh, the, uh, the Queen's death. To, to, they took it as an opportunity to remind us colonial times, to talk about historical justice. And one of the biggest trends in international relations these days is of course, um, 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 uh, compensation and those kind of things in international relations and international law more generally. So I'm just curious if uh, Chris or both of you can address the issue of how the, how the monarch gonna uh, function moving forward, taking into account that those kind of stories will, at least based on my humble judgment, will be amplified and not the other way around. Yeah, Chris, perhaps you might lead on that. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a really good point. I mean, it was prominent in the, in the coverage um, here. And uh, I think uh, two things really. And one is to say that uh, one of the Queen's sort of last wishes was that um, Charles should take over as head of the Commonwealth. Um, uh, and she uh, basically sort of secured that position for him uh, in advance to make sure that would happen. Um, and she did that because she really believed in the Commonwealth, which was effectively something she'd sort of created, really. Um, uh, and she believed in it wholeheartedly as a community of nations um, and wanted it to come under sort of his stewardship. Um, and I think that was sensible um, because one thing that the king believes in domestically is a much slimmed down monarchy. Um, he wants it to be a more sort of, uh, I guess, human, um, smaller institution. Um, and I think that sort of lightness of touch also applies uh, across uh, the Commonwealth more generally. So, um, you know, countries are coming forward and suggesting that they would like to sort of change their head of state and things like that. And I think there's a very relaxed view towards that. I think it's a recognition that part of modernization that will happen and that done in the right way, you know, relations can remain, can remain strong and, 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 and that's a positive. Um, but your, your question ever gets to sort of one step further than that, which is obviously then sort of reparations and, and things like that, which is, which is difficult. Um, I think uh, you have in probably Charles and in William, actually, uh, uh, two people who are sort of um, broadly sort of sympathetic to that kind of thinking. Um, but actually, it's, it's the government ultimately that will not be sympathetic towards it. So actually, the, the tension between those things will probably be between the sort of the monarchy and the government on that. And, and the monarchy wanted to indicate that they, they sort of get it. But ultimately, it's a political decision, things like that, and is unlikely to pass. So there could be a little bit of tension there. But I think you will see a much more sort of open 
dialogue around these things with um, the new king uh, and also with uh, the prince, new Prince Wales, uh, who has spoken out on these issues before. Yeah, and Elizabeth? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, it's such a wonderfully navigated topic, I think, in the first, uh, you know, in, in the last few, uh, few months, really, we've seen just an excellent um, way in which uh, the monarchy has handled this idea of we are open to rethinking and, and reframing our relationships with uh, countries around the world as befits the 21st century. I mean, what, what an elegant way to, you know, to, to handle all of this, especially against the backdrop that these issues are not specific, uh, you know, to the monarchy, but also are, uh, you know, hitting at uh, philanthropists or, you know, individuals who once established um, scholarships or universities or museums. This is part, as you say, so much of a, of a wider um, uh, conversation that I think has been very well handled. It also gets the point of the importance of a strong Britain. And I would even say then a strong uh, London as, as well. If, if the UK continues to be a place where it just makes sense to come to uh, build a business or to host a conference or to participate in, in the arts here, the, um, the, the galvanizing pull uh, of this country will continue to remain no matter what you know, some grumpy people say about the fact that, oh, it's all about empire from centuries ago. That's not why we're here. Um, that's not why I chose you know, to base here in London. Uh, Greenwich meantime just makes sense. Um, the volume of networks uh, here just makes sense all of the flights from Heathrow just make sense. Um, and so all of that means that there's a contemporary lens um, through which to see why it is that there's, it, it sometimes um, uh, feels as though um, the UK sits at the, at the center of so many international um, activities because that's as relevant today uh, as it was through a completely different context in a time when the UK, when Britain was at the height of its empire. And, and I think, you know, British institutions have been, um, you know, have been much derided in the last week or so, but, but, but people really believe in British institution. And I, and for better or for worse, I think, you know, the fact that we've had a very strong monarch sitting as the sort of head person of British institution has really delivered that. I remember a good friend of mine in Singapore saying that don't forget Simon that you know we like to do the deal in London so you know it all gets negotiated in the in Southeast Asia but then everybody flies to London to do the deal because it's British rule it's London the city it's the Queen it's it's everything so so that I think is a is a, again going back to that social impact that you were talking about there now I know I've got a question from Charlie Charlie Morgan so are you there Charlie can we yep get yep to, oh, there, he is. there you are there you are Charlie hi <laughs> come on in Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to go back slightly to the beginning to what, what you said, Elizabeth, and, and why and how America cast off the monarchy, as you said. It wasn't really about the monarchy. It was about, it was about no taxation without representation. Now, being an Australian, as you can hear, of course, I would like to pose a question to both of you. Um, and you have to have one assumption to start, which is you can't leave in place the British monarch being the head of state of Australia. Okay, so you have to you have to go with me on that bit um, because it just seems it seems it seemed mad to me, much as I love the monarchy in in living in Britain, that in Australia as a grown up country you still have a foreigner as your head of state. So if you just go with that, and in part I would also like to reference what Elizabeth said about january the 6th and and trump and what that sort of system can can do and how shaken how shaken it can be by things like that by somebody not being born to it and not having the power and also the thing that really struck me uh, after the queen's passing was was not the bit of the funeral but the but the bit of the ascension of Charles and, and, and the deals that have been done and as Simon said, have been honed for hundreds of years about the monarch's position. But we haven't got 400 years to hone that thing. So I'd like to ask either of you, or both of you, um, how would you put in place a new head of state in Australia on the basis that you think it should have its own? 
<laughs> so, okay, Chris, I got to go for you first, just because you look oh. like you're coming forward at that point. Yeah, I was just thinking, I, I was, well, I was just reflecting on the uh, machinations of the political leadership there over, over recent, recent months, so weeks <laughs> well, indeed. Awesome. Um, and then and you want to Anthony Albanese as your as your head of state. Look, um, I, I, I'm not sure I, I want to give uh, give instruction or, or, or suggestions, but I look, I agree with the, the the basic point, and I think it's it's sort of inevitable um, that uh, in sort of the fullness of time that 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 will change, and I presume um, it will move to a system um, more. Uh, I don't know if more, I was going to say more akin to the US system, but that's probably not quite right. But something at least a sort of honorary presidential system, I would have thought. Um, I don't quite know how you get there. Presumably it's through a, a, a referendum or two. Um, but I think something like that is is has always felt to me sort of slightly inevitable. One of my best friends lives in in Sydney, and I've talked to him about this a fair bit. And I think that's his view is that that's kind of you know in. Uh, the not too distant future that's sort of where you end up but how you get there not 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 100 percent sure can i just throw in there chris and as with the uh the situation in ireland where you you know the irish situation about which i'm not fully comprehensive perhaps chris you know more about it than than most of us because there there is an elected president am i right in saying that but but he but he but he doesn't have um constitutional authority Yes, I think that I think that's right. It's not having constitutional authority, and there are various models. I mean, I do a lot of work in Italy, for example, where they have uh, this sort of slightly strange system where the, the president is um, sort of sort of elected, but really chosen, and then you know on a on a sort of six year term, I think it is there, and things like this. So there are all these sort of different types, and I imagine you know something more akin to that is where I, I suspect Australia is heading, rather than the. Um, formal executive president that, that you have in, in the US. Mm -hmm. I also think we probably are needing to consider um, a bit more as well how we involve different um, ages um, and demographics in our political system. This is certainly a topic of conversation uh, in America with so many of our politicians now, uh, you know, of, of an age um, where typically they would be pulling back and retiring and instead they're you know, they're the, at the top of, of you know, every, every position. Um, there's a campaign I've noticed that started called Run Gen Z, um, which is getting a lot of traction right now on social media, trying to encourage younger people to go into politics. So what creatively do we need to start thinking about, about how we better bring together a system where you have age and experience, um, you know, as, as, as advisors, um, but then you're attracting, uh, you know, top talent from the, the middle generations to, to get in, in the game. And I know we could all talk about, you know, the House of Lords and all of that and what works and doesn't work about that system. But I do think it's interesting because it's going to start coming, it is already coming to a head in, in America with what we do about the fact that the only electable, uh, you know, leaders at a national level um, are, you know, are, are leaders that don't really represent um, you know, the, the thinking um, that, that is more at the middle of the, of the age spectrum. And Simon, I know we're coming close on, on time, but something else just that I think warrants reflecting on while we're gathered here is, you know, growing up in California as a young girl, I never had a female president to look up to, but there was always the queen. And, you know, because of our close relationship through the special relationship to uh, the UK, I didn't ever really appreciate what it meant to me psychologically that every time I came to London as a little girl, the currency and the stamps and, you know, everything had that had that queen's head on it. And it wasn't until she was gone that I really reflected on that. And it made me a bit sad to think about, you know, my six year old niece. Uh, or, or other little girls today that um, often don't have that many examples of female leadership at the top and now will also not know the, the queen. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's a very good point. The, uh, the dark side of me wanted to say that once Liz Truss has proved herself as one of the greatest prime ministers of this country, then your niece will, will, will surely revel in that. So um, just one more question, if we may. Amnon, Amnon in, uh, in New York. Um, come on through, Amnon, good to see you last week. Yeah. 
So is he still there? there he is, Amnon. Really different, different question, uh, which is the family. And my wife actually is a is a is a psychoanalyst and and family mediator. So I'm thinking about how we look at the royal family, and this what seemed to be from the outside ridiculous conflicts, and who is advising them how to manage these conflicts, which are the most, this is what the, the world see of the royal family. Yes, you're talking about the great, the great um, events and how beautiful everything is, quite right. But really what the world see is how the family conflict is not managed properly. Good point. Elizabeth, would you like to venture on well, that? Yeah, I, you know, I, I thought um, the, the king's um, address to the nation uh, that so elegantly um, referenced um, the life uh, that Harry and Meghan are choosing to live. And I loved the fact that he used the phrase overseas. Um, versus versus California, you know, California almost was too specific. It needed to be more broad than that. It was just so well handled and so well written in my in my view, and I think that was a very encouraging sign um, that uh, the uh, the speechwriters, the advisors, maybe Chris can talk a bit more about about that portfolio. But those individuals, uh, you know, clearly hit hit the mark um, very well there um, in handling that moment, and I was quite impressed. Yeah, uh, yes, it's interesting um, you say that, uh, Amnon. I think uh, the view, as just from here, as Elizabeth has just expressed, is that actually um, the family have responded quite well um, to. To be honest, I need to be careful what I say slightly, but various provocations uh, from, from others. Um, so, yes, absolutely, the, the king's um, uh, language that he used in his speech, but even previously, when really the family were being quite provoked, and there was a, a line that came out of Buckingham Palace about a particular allegation, which was just that recollections will differ. Um, and uh, the, I think certainly the perception is that um, actually the household has, in general, um, found the right language at the right time and just diffuse situations and taken the heat out of uh, situations. And I think it's very much their view that actually that is the right thing to do because ultimately, um, you know, obviously really talking about uh, Harry and Meghan, that ultimately that it will slightly burn itself out, that there is clearly angst, there are clearly issues, but that um, given enough space and time, um, it will slightly sort of not resolve itself but it will at least sort of diffuse itself a little um and so very much the approach is just take the heat out of the situation um and stress that you know as the king did they're still very much loved but they are pursuing a different path and that was as agreed yeah absolutely. i think that uh, that uh, the royal family really had an opportunity especially with a different mixed race um a, which really symbolize a lot, you know, the nature of the people who live in the UK and the Commonwealth. And I think they miss an opportunity because over it's felt like from the outside that there is still quite a different opinion inside the royal family, which was sad really, because I thought it was just a wonderful, it was a beautiful woman who can speak well, who can really communicate. Um, why not bring it, bring it in and, and use it? And it was kind of a shame it all turned into kind of fiasco. Yes. Well, as I say, I think the, the uh, well, household would say recollections differ. Uh, on the on the on these matters, and uh, I, but I don't uh, have the detail. But only from someone from the outside, and I have no knowledge. It just really, no, no. And it's 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 a, it's a very, you know, sad situation all round. Um, but I think, uh, well, people have their have their views on what what really happened. 
Um, but there's uh, been a serialization in the Times newspaper in London recently of, of a new book that's, that's coming out. Um, and uh, I'd sort of recommend looking that up because uh, certainly that serialization chimes with everything I've heard about what actually went on. Yeah, likewise as well. I mean, I've heard from a couple of sources stories that um, are now in that book um, and from from people that I that I know and trust and 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 so I, I, I would concur with you on that but but no one's ever going to quite agree on that subject but uh, <laughs> but uh, and 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 here we are finishing a talk on democracy and and monarchy with Meghan Markle but anyway um, I see I, I'd rather finish because I can see Alan there Alan Hilberg can we go to Alan just quickly to say hello Sorry you weren't able to join the call here, but lovely to see you back because I know you haven't been well and uh, we've got you on mute there. Let's get you off mute. Can you come off mute there, Alan? You have to do it yourself. I, yeah, I apologize for this, uh, the unfortunate commitments of business. Absolutely, one well, understands that, but you know, you've been such an important part of Forum and especially Forum TV. So it's just good to see you back and good to see you in good health. And uh, so it's uh, nice to finish on an up note there. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Um, thank you to Elizabeth and to, and to Chris. And you know, when the time is right, we will do Forum TV. I think you know, it's, not, it's not like it used to be in lockdown. When we were doing it on a weekly fortnightly basis but you know when the time is right and for goodness sake if there's um anybody out there who wants to come up with a topic conversation that we feel is particularly opposite to today then please be in touch and we will make it happen indeed this conversation happened because charlie morgan came at me and said you should be talking about this so thank you very much to charlie melissa and thank you to everyone and have a good afternoon and a good evening thank you thank you thank you, thank you. thank you. thank you.